I have chosen the small working man by Rodin because I think it's, a, it's an important sculpture, of course, and it's a sculpture which uh, helps to, to understand uh, Rodin's approach to sculpture. It was cast in 1903 for Mrs. Simpson, who had uh, recently made uh, Rodin's acquaintance and who admired a lot Rodin's work and who gave a beautiful collection to the National Gallery of Art. It's a very interesting uh, choice on her part to have this sculpture, which was a very new sculpture at that time, and also a very modern one, uh, a sculpture looking toward the uh, 20th century and not a sculpture related to 19th century sculpture. We have to, to remember that in the beginning of the 80s, Rodin was quite a traditional sculptor and he wanted to exhibit in the Salon, which was the official annual exhibition in Paris. And in 1878-79, he decided to make a St. John the Baptist preaching. And for this sculpture, he made some studies, some torso studies, and he just forgot one of them in a corner of the studio. And after a while, he rediscovered the, the study, which was uh, decayed and cracked, and some parts of it uh, had fallen down. And he thought it was as beautiful as the antique, and he decided to preserve it, uh, to have a plaster cast made from the sculpture, and you can recognize it here in, in this part, and see, in fact, all these cracks. At the very end of the 19th century, perhaps 98-99, Rodin decided to stuck this study terso on a pair of legs, which were intended for St. John the Baptist, but uh, which were in a perfect state. And he didn't try uh, to hide the contrast between the two parts of the sculpture, and here we see these perfect legs uh, and the, the torso uh, as it was. It is said that Rodin's assistants, when they brought this very large plaster at the salon, that they, they said, oh, but it's a working man. And then Rodin adopted the title and the, and the working man became the title of the sculpture. And I think it's not only just a, a story, an anecdote, but it, uh, it tells a lot about the uh, Rodin process. Because in 19th century, French sculpture has always something to, to tell, a story to tell, a message to give. But here you have no longer a story. The working man is only a description. Sculpture now exists only by itself. You have not to think of a story, of a context. You are just in front of the form, in front of the volume, and its energy is enough to bring the message the sculpture should bring. It's a thing on which Rodin has been thinking for a, a very long time, as soon as the beginning of the 80s, when he was working for the Gates of Hell and modeling all these little bodies, he was no longer interested in the people who Dante was supposed to have met when he visited Hell, but he just wanted to express passion or anger and all the passions that human people can feel. And it is also the reason for which Rodin sculptures are praised everywhere in the world. So the working man was exhibited and very much admired. It was admired as a kind of a renaissance of antiquity. People thought they, they could recognize the beauty of antique sculpture. But I think they did not take notice of what is perhaps the most interesting in the sculpture, and which is the, the impression of movement uh, that it gives. We are in 1907, the futurist artists began to think about all this question of movement and representation of movement. The Manifest Futurist uh, will be published in 1909, and we have here an impression of movement, a dynamism inside the sculpture, which is extremely strong. However, 
The two feet are flat on the ground, which is not the true attitude of a walk. When you look at the Moy Bridge photographs, for instance, you see that you always have one of the hills appraised. However, you have this strong impression of a, of a body who is going forward. And I think uh, Rodin uh, got that impression by the, the, the axes of, of the torso and of the legs, which are not exactly on the same line. And also the sculpture is a little leaning forward. And, uh, and, and then you have no head, you have no arms, which uh, would have been a kind of destruction. You are just uh, looking at this part of the body and the, the movement it suggests. So it was very much admired, and uh, a group of Rodin's admirers decided to offer a bronze cast to the French state. They wanted this bronze copy to be put in the Cortile of Palazzo Farnese in Rome. I think that uh, for Rodin, it must have been a very great uh, joy, uh, because Rodin admired a lot Michelangelo, of course, he admired a lot antiquity, and to have this sculpture, which is, uh, in a sense, the end of his career, it really is one of the sculptures which explains best his long, long process and his long reflection about sculpture. And I think that to see it in, in the center um, of Rome uh, and so close uh, to Michelangelo and antiquity uh, made him uh, extremely happy. It's a great luck for the National Gallery of Art to, to be able to, to exhibit this sculpture. In fact, Mrs. Simpson was so convinced of the quality of the sculpture that she had uh, her sister to commission another copy and it happens that it was the time when the National Gallery of Art was built and opened. And here, they were able to explain that they are very large galleries, uh, empty, and they would be very, very happy to have the collection. And for the National Gallery of Art, yes, it's, it's, it's a wonderful uh, acquisition, the whole collection, but also, especially, this sculpture, which, uh, which means so much about Rodin and history of sculpture.